So here is the Tektronix Type 502A or 502A dual beam oscilloscope rather that I won from an eBay auction about a year ago. And when it was shipped to me, unfortunately, they shipped it in such a manner that the CRT broke into about 500 pieces inside. So it has been quite an arduous task to come inside of here and go through all of the boards and all of the uh, cap open capacitors there and so forth to get all that glass out. I'm not even sure I got 100% of it out yet. Fortunately, no tubes were broken in the process, so that's good, other than the CRT, which is, of course is a, is a tube. But overall, the reason that I bothered to get it from the auction is from many of the ones that I've seen, this one's pretty darn clean. I, that's why I wanted it. Now, of course, none of these are going to ever be perfect. They go back to many, many moons ago um, but this one particularly is quite clean and pretty and i don't think it's going to need a lot of work if i'm lucky so this is pretty interesting it looks like back in the day tektronix sent them right to the university of pennsylvania into a gentleman's name that i'll keep private here so Maybe he was a professor there, possibly. It says, 502, do not reorder. Probably because they ordered two of them. And this is what the outside of the box looks like. Glass, handle with care. Outside mail. Cathode ray tube. Little tectronic symbol down there. Same thing on the other side. And then finally, same thing there. All right, let's get one of these open. This one was actually pulled from another oscilloscope. But this one looks much more pristine. Look at that getter mark. Getter mark on either side there. 5021. This one, I'll bet you, is untouched. My guess. This one's probably never been mounted in a scope. Yeah, look how clean those pins are. You can still see the soldering on the end. Seeing that we have a broken CRT, we might as well take advantage of the fact that we can see inside this puppy. So on the outside, here we have 14 individual connection pins. Then there's a index pin here for alignment. This entire piece is held together with four Pyrex tubes. These glass tubes here. There's two guns, one for the upper beam, one for the lower beam. Then you have the horizontal plates here. The breakdown of a gun in this particular essence is there's a heater and a cathode back here. These are focusing anodes and the final anode here, but I believe that all three of these are focusing anodes. Two deflection plates here for either upper or lower, conversely which side it is, they're identical. And then how we access the horizontal plates is these two pins here, and the other ones are broken off, but you can see some remnants of the prior access points in those on the tube are here. Here we can see one, two, three, four, five pins. Other side, these two pins here must be for the horizontal plates. This particular tube, if we look at this, if I can bring this back into the shot, sits in the oscilloscope approximately like so. And the two tubes that I have here are a little bit different. This one has a, I'm not really sure what this is. I can't find much information, but this is a later tube, the 5021 versus the 520 that I have there. This might be a post accelerating electrode access point because the other tube 
doesn't have that. So I found that to be interesting. Again, this being the 520 and this one being the 521-2 actually. So I'll probably choose this one to go in for the project. The manual of the 502A shows the bezel here and the brackets that keep this CRT in place. But because the CRT was such in a broken state, I have no opportunity to really understand how it's supposed to go together. So it's going to be my guess compared to anybody else because I have yet to see a video online of anybody showing how to install a CRT with those particular parts. I ended up ordering parts online because this particular bezel was broken and it's a ring that goes inside and this is responsible through this little knob apparatus here. It goes like this and then as you turn it uh, you're able to adjust the CRT uh, horizontal physical horizontal balance of the CRT tube itself, the cathode ray tube. So I ordered some parts online and the picture that I got was showing one of these intact. And there it is. But there's a problem with that. Problem is, I don't know if you can detect or not, but there's a side missing. You see that? I'll put it up there in blue. So I guess between the two of them, I sort of have a full one. They're supposed to be side by side like that. So one part of the bezel goes around each side of this little brass block right here, uh, as you can see there for adjusting. So I'll try to use the one that guy from eBay sent me, but might be worth, you know, I was wondering, should I ever get into 3D printing? But this might be something worth 3D printing if these things are becoming unobtainium and if they're breaking like this because they're brittle and old. Or maybe somebody in YouTube land is a 3D aficionado. And if you are, you can send me a message and I will send you whichever one of these I don't use. And maybe you can make me one for a reasonable price. And you might be able to sell them on eBay because they're not around. I couldn't find any that have both sides. I realize now that this must be the right piece because this guy here does have the two tabs. Those tabs look like they've gone here and here. You see the prior one that used to be in here, maybe. Got to source these from different folks. So let's take a look. So I'm going to imagine that this guy See, it's in like that. Yep, yeah, okay. And then you can see where there's kind of a lock there. Where that tab is kind of locked here into that pin. But this being on the opposite side here. And then that will give me the function here. All right, I got it. It's always the right tool for the job. So I'm going to choose this hook tool. I'm going to hold it here and I'm going to grab that one that has the tab. I can. Ah, there it is. So now that that's in, I have to get this guy and hopefully not break this guy here and hopefully not break the uh, piece for the adjustment. That has to sit in here about like so. So I had to actually remove this entire thread rod and then through some more finger gymnastics, I was able to get that bezel back in there. I used the one that I got from eBay with the one broken side. So now I just got to put this puppy back in here, get that lined up, and we'll be back. So this particular CRT has six pins, or one, two, three, four, five pins on top. I'm not sure if you can see them there, there to the left side of, of the label. And then two more pins on the bottom coming out of the CRT for connection purposes. So let's try to put this puppy in. Be careful here. There's nothing for me to touch underneath. So I'm going to kind of float it in like that. And now 
you know, support the backside a little bit and push forward. So from this side, you can see that plastic ring. Try to get the camera right there in the center there. You can see that plastic ring is on the other side of the metal bracket. And then goes through the blue bracket, cups onto the back side of the CRT, then the ring goes on and the adjustment screw goes through. So now that we have that portion done, the last thing is to line up this index pin with the CRT and put it on the back. So prior to me putting this cap on the end of the CRT, of course the unit is unplugged through the entire process of placing the CRT in. One thing that needs to be done, at least in my opinion, is if any pins need retensioning, you can do that through here. If they need cleaning, what I do is I make a, a small solution of contact cleaner and isopropyl alcohol, and I use a pipe cleaner and just go inside each one of these and get them clean. And once that's done, if you put the end cap on, wow, that was pretty easy. Again, the index uh, needs to be lined up then you can press the back gently. I think that's about as far as she's gonna go. Once you have the end cap index pin lined up and you've seated the end cap onto the CRT, this screw shouldn't be tightened down a whole lot yet. It's obviously clamping onto the bezel, which is clamping onto the plastic ring at the very end. And you have to do a gross movement meaning physical movement of the CRT itself to get it in general alignment and then tighten this puppy down with this brass block being roughly on center. And that gives me the ability to move it left or move it right, conversely twisting the CRT for fine adjustment. Installation transformer is on the 115 setting. My current limiter is off at the moment. Um, we're gonna bring this up a little bit. All right, looks like about 42 volts, something like that. See if we get any activity. Oh, looks like the fan is just starting to move. All right, so let's go back over here. We're actually 48 volts coming out of the uh, isolation transformer. Let's bring that up a little bit more. Let's go somewhere maybe 63, 76. Oh, fan's going a little bit more. Let me get this mounted again here. Let's see, let me turn the lights off. Uh, let's see, are we starting to get any glow on the tubes? Oh, a little bit, a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. All right, no smoke yet. That's a good sign. We are at 86 volts. And 93 volts. Let's see, do we have a trace? Do we have a trace? Oh my, look at that. We have two solid traces on there. Highly at an angle though. So I can see why the alignment's needed. Let's go back and look at those tubes. Let's go for 117 volts. That's the uh, premium voltage that they recommend for this. It can go up to 125, uh, but 117 is what they uh, state in the manual as premium operating voltage. Those two, oh, it's tube land in there. Yeah, let's look at the other side, let's see. Let me turn the lights on before I turn that around. Uh, so I don't hurt anything. Back side. Mm-hmm. Got tubes up top there that are glowing. Let's get a shot of that in the dark. Yes, sirree. Looks good. Uh, the light. There it is. Now let's look back at this trace here. Wow, that's quite a... That's quite a trace. Let's see if we can bring that down a little bit. Uh-huh, okay, I got some mo movement. I can, oh, a little sharp folks, they're nice. Thin trace, lovely. 
So I thought it might be interesting to turn this on and watch what happens when the traces come up. Right now, the all the tubes are starting to heat up, and as they heat up, they start to do their function. Uh, individually, each tube has a specific job that it does inside the unit. So here we can see, in a sense, what's happening as those tubes are starting to warm up and what's happening with the traces as they as they turn on. You can see there's one trace on there that's prevalent now. And here comes the other one as they're starting to stabilize on the deflection plates. Great, so there's our two traces. We could actually change the intensity a little bit more. You can see. And from where I'm looking, they're generally level. So I've already taken the time to make that adjustment for the CRT. And they should be balanced against the graticule. So this is interesting. I have a one kilohertz sine wave going into the upper beam and you can see the trace bouncing in fact both traces are bouncing uh, the upper and lower beam are moving left and right and this is another interesting thing let's see if I can get both of these in the shot watch that trace when I move this tube so we either have a broken solder joint or part of that tube is part of the problem or it could be as simple as a dirty tube socket let's find out well I have that 6AU6 in my tube tester and it shows good to go so not the tube now that we know I have to clean all of these tube sockets and the pins for the tubes. I'll show you my methodology for doing it, which is different than some, so take it for what it's worth. This is a microfiber cloth. What I do is I grab the tube and I just do small ro circular rotations, trying not to put too much of an angle or too much pressure on the tube one way or the other, pulling down or away from the tube socket. I also try not to disturb the label too much. Lots of times these old labels, once they've been heated up, throughout the years it can be easily wiped off so if you want to retain that be cautious of that so here's what i do i take the tube out and prior to doing that i prepare a solution i in this particular case i use a glass dish and then i take a little bit of contact cleaner and here in this case we have uh crc you can get this at lowe's home depot it's a pretty good contact cleaner i think I just cut my hand and put a little shot in there so I'm not getting it everywhere else. And then I take the isopropyl alcohol and let that be the majority of what's in the dish. So once that solution is prepared and off to the side, waiting for the tube, with dry hands, I'll pull that tube again, making small rotations until it's out and I allow the muscle memory of my hand to kind of know where that pin has to go back. You see the space there on, this is a nine pin tube and there's a space there. So we'll call that the index of how it needs to set back in. If you get it wrong, you can potentially bend the pins on the tube and that's not a good thing. So I just take the tube and I drop it and just let the solution touch the pins and then I place it back inside the tube socket and then roll it back in until it's fully seated and I pull it back out again and I'll do this a few times depending on what I see once the tube is out two to three times in that case that wasn't too bad just that friction of moving it in and moving it out actually cleans those two pins and their the socket typically while I'm in there also, I'll take and get a visual on the socket and make sure that the pins are tensioned properly, but that's a different topic. 
So additionally, while I'm here, what I'll do is these open switches where you can actually physically see the contacts and they're not inside of a housing, they also need to be cleaned. So being careful where I stick my hands, of course, the unit is unplugged, doing any of this cleaning and operations, and all of the capacitors have been discharged, so there's nothing that's going to hurt me while I have my hands inside. I'll simply take a little time to take contact cleaner, appropriate contact cleaner, this has no lubricants inside, and just give a slight spray there, don't need very much at all. Now, of course, you're going to hit some resistors and you're going to hit some caps, but just try not to uh, as much as possible. Some instances you can shield things with cloth and so forth. In this case, there's not much back behind that direction and I can get an easy quick spray in there. Same thing here, just one spray. You don't need a lot. Some people tend to really spray until there's liquid dripping everywhere. You, that's unnecessary. Just a little bit will go a long way. So most of these pots that are here or potentiometers have a carbon track on the inside that requires a little bit of lubricant. I use this particular one. It has a silicone inside that it leaves behind, pulls all the other liquids out or they dissolve rather when you spray the pots a little bit. So just wanting to be sure that you use a lubricant style that's for pots, not a standard contact cleaner that is for external items like the tube sockets or open switches. So something else I was going to mention is if you were to have to replace any of the parts that are being held in these ceramic standoffs, you would need to use silver solder or silver bearing solder rather for doing so. So Tektronics in this particular era, when they used this build type, they supplied a little bit of silver solder here. You can see on that spool it's probably maybe a foot on or so of it on there. And there's a, even a note here that talks about only using silver bearing solder inside of these individual slots if having to replace a component. So if you're working on one of these, keep that in mind. Should you find yourself needing to verify whether or not the oscillator section of this or another tube oscillator circuit is functioning, a quick test that you can perform is to hold a neon bulb against the glass of the oscillator tube. In this case, for this scope, we are at circuit position V800, and the tube is a 6CZ5. Before performing such a test, be certain you are educated on the dangers of working with high voltage circuitry, minding good safety practices. As this must be performed with a live circuit and could potentially harm you, should you unintentionally touch a live area of the scope that has high voltage. Also keep in mind that a device such as this can harm you if the circuit is off or on. You've got caps inside that can still hold live charge. Be warned, if you're following along, you're doing so at your own endangerment. So as I touch the neon bulb to the oscillator tube, we can observe that it produces a low glow, indicating the circuit is at least functioning on a basic level. So you can see there, as I touch it, pull it away, touch it to the glass, pull it away. So this is important that you do this with a neon bulb completing the circuit. In this case, this is actually happening because the neon bulb is essentially borrowing a small potential of current from the ions in my body. This allows enough electrons to charge the bulb to provide the low glow we see here. That charge is also being conducted through the steel tweezers I'm holding the bulb with. Conversely, if I held the bulb, obviously only by the glass and not by the leads, we can see there's no activity in the bulb. So you can do this with a set of steel tweezers, still pick up enough to show the test. So here we can see a little placard on the very back of the unit that says connected for 117 volts operating range, 105 to 125 volts here, 50 to 60 hertz. This of course is a fuse. This of course is the US standard in reverse. And then this is the fuse data chart. We see that it says 117 volts, 60 hertz requires a four amp fast blow fuse. And then 50 hertz would require a 3.2 amp slow. If this were 
wired for a 234 volt input, the fuse would be a 2 amp fast or 1.6 amp slow. Maximum watts of the unit is 290, maximum voltage amps is 315. That's a whole lot of options for this guy for back in the day. Check out this transformer. So here's the transformer that's located to the right and rear of the oscilloscope itself. I'm going to zoom in here just a little bit so we can see the foil that's on the side of the transformer. It says power transformer has two extra windings permitting nominal primary voltages. And it goes through the entire range here at 50 or 60 hertz operation. So here we see a 117 volt diagram where pins 1, 2, and 3, and 4 are connected. And also we have the 230 volt uh, connection option where you have 2 and 3. Let's look at the bottom of the transformer to see what they're talking about. Here's the bottom of the transformer. You can see the amount of individual windings this transformer has quite a bit. Imagine having to source one of these equivalent today or having to have one made or even rewound. Man, this is quite a complex transformer. If I zoom in here just a little bit, not sure if you can see all the numbers, but this is pin one, pin two, pin three, and pin four tied together so we can have that 117 volts that the placard on the back is stating this is wired at. You could do the two to three wiring here for the 234 volts if you were in Europe or somewhere where that was your voltage and that was the indicated amount that you needed to come in. So if you needed to work on the amplitude calibrator of this particular model scope, you could come to the side, follow this black wire up to this section here, and we can see that inside the 6AU6 and the 6BL8. So if you needed to work, there's your two tubes. And then I'll give you a shot from the bottom here. So here's that black wire that runs from the calibrator. And then here's the bottom of the sockets. You can see the 6AU6 there and the 6BL8 there and the circuitry for that section. Here we can see the entire bottom of the chassis. If I start in the upper left hand corner, this is the circuit for the lower beam. This is the back side of the circuit board for the upper beam and is accessible through the left side of the unit when the unit is sitting upright. They're just in reverse, but they're identical boards. This is the variable switch. You can see the potentiometer on the back. You can see adjustable capacitors throughout. Try not to touch those unless you really know what you're doing for the calibration. Moving on, this is the back of the potentiometer for the amplitude calibrator. And again, we talked about those two tubes on the other side for that section. Some circuitry provided for that section as well. This is the 350 volt power supply and the caps responsible for that section. Here you can see the backside of the 150 volt power supply and those tubes for that section. We'll flip it over now and I'll show you that side. So here is the upper beam circuit. Again, flipped in reverse compared to the other one, but accessible on this side. You can see the other rail. I'll try to pick a camera up, we'll see. This is the variable stack here for that switch. Same thing, pot back there, variable capacitors. Additionally, here is the portion of the 350 volt supply. You can see the label there. The 150 volt supply is here. Additionally, right here, these three tubes, there is the 100 volt supply. Again, circuitry accessible from the back side. And here we have, of course, the fan. And this particular potentiometer here, I think that one, yeah, that's the on and off switch. This guy right here. So here's the top of this unit. Most of the circuitry you're looking at here is the horizontal display as well as the time base and the trigger. These two are covers for the high voltage. There's a adjustment through here that you should only use a plastic tool on. And then there's a test point here. 
So here we can see the top again with a view of all of these potentiometers that are for calibrating this particular scope. There are other potentiometers throughout the unit that also are positioned in different parts of the chassis, but this is the majority up here. So if you're looking to do a calibration on one of these for this particular model and you have the manual, you'll be spending a lot of time in this section. So let's talk about some of the attributes of this oscilloscope real quick. So if I turn this intensity knob up a little bit, you'll see that there is a lower beam that's receiving a one kilohertz external signal from my signal generator coming into this B side of the lower beam. This particular oscilloscope has an upper beam and a lower beam as well as a horizontal display. So right now this one kilohertz sine wave is being fed in through a P6006. Not sure if you can see that or not. I have to take my word for it. P6006 probe. There's the hook for the probe as well. BNC connector on the other side. That's the probe that came with this model initially. So I have one of those probes hooked up here again to the lower beam providing the signal that you're seeing there. So if we start up here, we see upper focus. You can watch that trace for focus. Lower. Intensity, of course, you see me move that already. Intensity balance, that will change how much power each of the individual traces are receiving. In this case, we'll try to make it 50-50. This is a little interesting one. This is the power and, and scale illumination. So right now you'll see the graticules look red. If I turn this all the way to the right, that red dis disappears. Well, what's happening is there are two incandescent light bulbs here, both of which are pushed through the graticule plastic plate here. And then there's a red paint on the inside of that portion. And when you illuminate those bulbs, it gives the illusion that the graticules are red. So there's some reflection happening there. I think it looks pretty neat. I'm not sure how much of that you can see on the camera, but it's quite red here. Moving on, if we look at this section here, we can see that there's an A, there's a B, there's an A, there's a B. This particular switch will allow you to go from the AC coupling side and choose this input as A or this input as B. Same thing here for the DC coupling side. So you, essentially you could have four different inputs here and you could switch between them to be able to see the trace on the scope. This is your amplitude switches. You can see here, now it's the wrong one. <laughs> there we go. See how, how much that rises when I'm at point one. Now we're back down to point two. This is the finder. So if I press that, let's say that the deflection plate and the beam was way off, I couldn't see, it's way down here. I can press this and it'll show me where it's at in height. So right now it's below the center, so I know that that's where it's at. So I can bring it up. Conversely, if it's way up there, it shows above the line. Uh, I'm up, so I can bring it down. This is a coarse DC balance. The coarse portion on either one of these particular potentiometers is actually you put a screwdriver on the inside and that will give you the DC offset. The actual movement here is fine or the course is done by again putting a screwdriver in there and that will give you a course adjustment. But here you can see it moving just barely up and down for the DC balance there. So that's really a fine adjustment on the outside, course on the inside. Moving on to the horizontal display right now, we're at one time or times one magnification. Here you can see times two, times five, so forth and so on. This is the position also for left and right. Conversely, the position for up and down you've already seen here. Same thing for the upper and lower beams. Here we have the time variable. Right now we're at 0.5. There's one, 0.2, so you can see what that particular switch does. Here's the triggering section. So for instance, right now I'm on lower AC. We'll use the amplitude calibrator. Uh, let's put this on right now, it's on five millivolts. So let's go to five millivolts. And we can see that if I wanna trigger on the upper one, we can take that right off the screen. 
I can use the amplitude calibrator here and I have my scope set on five millivolts per vertical graticule and then I've got it here also so that's fairly accurate I guess while we're here we'll go through let's see 50 millivolts and let's put that on 50 oh, same thing pretty good 0.5 looking good 5 volts see 5 volts here again looks pretty accurate 50 volts this is a little bit rare to have on, on this particular unit I don't have a 50 volt setting here but I do have a 20 so I can take the bottom of the signal and put it on one graticule line and if we count these we, we can see that if this is 10 20 30 halfway between would be 50 so that would indicate 50 volts so that's that's functioning just fine there so again if I wanted to trigger on the lower we can see there's the lower and let's see what else this is the trigger level so we can actually manually adjust the trigger level here so another function of this oscilloscope is if you had an external curve tracer in this case this is the RCA quick tracer and you use the external input here of the horizontal display for the y-axis and the x-axis for the lower beam as long as you had the unit switch on to time base amp essentially you could use it for curve tracing and in this case we use it for curve tracing for component testing so if you were inside of a circuit and you wanted to compare one component versus another in this case I just have separate components so here's like a, a poly cap should give us a circle boom there it is nice how about an electrolytic cap with a different value quality good a diode should give us a 90 degree angle with a square knee there it is conversely if I reverse it it should go the opposite direction looks like a good diode Resistor should give us a slight angle. Yep. And a transistor, I don't know what the order of this one is, particularly emitter base collector, but a transistor could give us one side. Let's see. All right, we've got a diode on that side. On the other side, it looks like something like a Zener diode. So you can compare one against the other and see basically what uh, you're getting if a component is bad or not I thought it might be interesting to highlight how you make the probe adjustment and sort of calibrate the probe for the unit itself so right now there is a square wave into the unit here and this is the probe there's no screw to, to make the adjustment so what you do is you hold this end and watch the uh, trace there see how that's moving up when I turn this moving down moving up so that's how you get the balance and calibrate the probe many modern probes will have a small screw that you'll turn to make that same adjustment here it's done in a twisting fashion another feature here is the vertical signal out there is one jack for the upper beam one jack for the lower beam additionally there is a CRT cathode ground here but right now I'll just feature this so I'm gonna turn this around and you can see that right now from here I have a 5 volt square wave going into the scope here and then you can see the out is going to my scope that's across the shop so watch here if I if you can get this in the shot. See how they're connected. In order to put these covers back on, in this case we got the right, you'll see that it's labeled front here, and then there are these plastic wings for the screws. This one has a stop by a washer that is here. This one's missing that washer. So maybe I'll get one in the future. Put the bottom in first. 
and then squeeze the top metal in. This one will stop because it has that washer with the stop built in. This one I know if I turn it 90 degrees here, at least it's locking the orientation in for the moment. Same thing here for the left side. Missing another washer. But you put the bottom in first and the top. This one stops. Good to go. For putting the bottom on, before I do that, you can see here that this one is quite dented. Not too uncommon for a scope of this era to have been set down hard. Somebody wasn't familiar with how strong these bottoms can be, or in this case, how weak they can be. So they set it obviously on the corner of something, perhaps is what it looks like. Not real sure. So before I can put this cover back on, I'm going to go and address that. Well, I got a little bit of it out. It's generally straight now, so that's the best that I can hope for for this particular scope at this time. This is how the bottom goes on. Thanks so much for watching.